We're live. Friends, welcome to We Waste Wise, the 2018 Global Dialogue on Waste. Um, we already have um, Chaz and Cole here um, ready to speak. But before that happens, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been doing over the past five years, uh, what we've achieved, and uh, where we plan to go. Um, we started in 2013 with the mission to connect people who are looking for solutions with those who can provide those solutions. And as you know, um, most knowledge is in PDF, lengthy PDF reports or in certain um, high quality conferences. Um, but for knowledge dissemination, uh, decision makers don't read through 200 pages of a, a PDF to, before they take a decision, uh, or they don't always have access to high quality, good conferences um, to get this knowledge. So for the sake of knowledge dissemination, uh, we've created a um, platform which is easily scalable and can create um, content which can be consumed and um, used, um, consumed and understood very easily. Um, in, in 2013, we started with eight events, and um, this year we've organized 35 events. Um, that's almost uh, one event every one and a half weeks. And uh, next year we plan to do, um, get closer to one event every week. And um, over the past five years, we've helped various organizations around the world uh, disseminate their knowledge. Uh, we've been working with ISPA, the International Solid Waste Association, and uh, we've recently worked with uh, Asian Development Bank, and we're also working with World Bank um, in a few weeks to um, to launch their uh, the new version of the Water Waste Report. Um, so uh, if your organization is um, looking for a platform to get your knowledge out there in an easily consumable way, then you know please do get in touch with us, and then you know we can work on it. We are a nonprofit organization and we're doing this to invest in our collective future. And this is one of the best ways to um, make sure um, our, we have a long sustained future um, together. Um, with that, let me get through some housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions or um, comments, use the live chat window below the video stream um, to uh, put them to uh, the speakers. And um, you can also tweet to us at BWasteWise. And um, today I'm joining from India, a slight change in plans. So in case if there is any um, uh, problem with the video stream, wait for 10 minutes and then refresh the stream and then you should be able to um, have the stream back. Um, with that, let me uh, turn it over to Cole. Cole is the senior editor of Waste Die. Um, a recent promotion, um, I'm sure, because he's one of the very few journalists uh, who covers um, the waste management sector in, as a full-time reporter. So, Paul, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise again. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, take it from here. Great. Thank you, Ranjith, and uh, congratulations on the sixth year of the Global Dialogue on Waste. And uh, joining me this morning, Chaz Miller, who really needs no introduction, folks have been... Uh, who follow the industry, know Chaz well uh, from his time at the National Waste and Recycling Association, as well as uh, ongoing uh, monthly columns at Waste360. And so to start it off, uh, always great to have a chance to talk to you, Chaz. We talk off and on, but nice to do this formally. Um, when we talk about the future for recycling, changes in recycling, it's hard to avoid China, of course. Everyone's all China all the time in the past year or so. And your columns, in my view, you know, encourage people to take the longer view, not panic, you know, put this into historical context. And so um, the July one comes to mind as well. You know, you said the sky is not falling. Let's remember there have been market crashes before. To start it off, I'd be curious to hear, you know, where you think things stand now. You know, do you feel that is still the case, especially with some of the potential disruption from the tariffs that we might be seeing? You know, where? how do you think we look going into the fall on the markets? Well, <laughs> I think the first question is you got to put this in a little bit of context. Uh, China clearly started planning this so well over a decade ago, maybe even longer. Uh, they need a clean environment. They've seen what they've done to their country's environment over the last 50 or 60 years. They have a growing middle class that wants a clean environment. So it's a perfectly laudable thing for the government to do, to, to try to clean up its environment. And one of the first things they did to start closing some of the slower, inefficient, and frankly, badly polluting smaller paper mills in the country. We had the green fence in 2013, which was a major wake up call. There were unscrupulous people shipping garbage in, in bales disguised as recyclables. And there were some processors just doing a lousy job. 
we had in 2017 the National Sword. And the interesting thing about the National Sword is it was barely noticed in the United States. Uh, in fact, in Waste Expo that summer, it wasn't mentioned except as a sidelight possibly for plastics. However, later that summer, they posited the idea of a ban on a number of recyclables, including mixed paper and mixed plastics, which are so important to curbside recycling programs in particular. And in March of 2018 of this year, that ban went into effect. So they're clearly serious about this. And then later this summer, they introduced the idea of potentially a ban on all recyclables. Now that could be the game changer, but what we know right now is that mixed paper and mixed plastics simply are not moving to China. They've stopped moving, period. OCC, old corrugated boxes, are still moving to China, but clearly at reduced levels. We know that in this country, some curbside programs have ceased operations. Others have cut back on the, on the materials they accept. Some recyclables have, in fact, been landfilled for lack of markets, although I think the amount of landfilling has been somewhat exaggerated, but it really depends on what part of the country and the West Coast appears to have been hit more severely than the East Coast because the West Coast is more dependent on the export market. Uh, for the most part, recyclables are moving, but at low prices and, and in some cases at negative prices. So you look at what we've seen in the past on previous cycles, in some ways, this is nothing new. I mean, recyclables are commodities. Like all commodities, their value goes up and down. Like all commodities, there's never a guaranteed price. And anybody who says they can come up with a program that will somehow uh, figure out a way to avoid price fluctuations, that, that overturns all the laws and, and understandings of economics. Since 1990, we've had at least six serious downturns in the prices for recyclables. Three of them are just normal economic uh, downturns or, or disruptions in the supply and demand cycle. But three are very noteworthy. The first one was 2008, when the Chinese essentially closed all their factories to ensure blue skies for the Beijing Olympics. Prices utterly collapsed from July of 2008 to the end of the year. However, once those factories were back, once everything got cleaned up, once all the, the reserve stockpiles had been eaten through, prices rebounded so that a year after the price collapse, prices were actually a little bit higher than they had been before. The demand was there. 1990 was probably the first really nasty one regarding curbside recycling because 1990 you saw the onrush of new programs in this country. The garbage barge had gone on its voyage in 1987. There had been tremendous public reaction to the garbage barge. We saw a, a, a slew of state legislation and city after city launching a recycling program. By 1990, markets were utterly swamped. The, the, the supply had just drowned the demand. And it took about three years for markets to recover as new markets developed and they came online. So in some ways, what we're seeing now is similar to 1990, and the markets are currently swamped, but it's a very unique situation this time because this has nothing to do with normal supply and demand. This has nothing to do with the economy. It has everything with the desire of a government to clean up its environment by rejecting recyclables as something that can be imported by essentially rewriting the definition, the specific the specification for recyclables. And that rewriting of the specifications, the 0.5% contamination uh, maxima, that is very significant. And the real issue is, is how serious are they about this? Uh, will they follow through on the ban on all recyclables? And we won't know the answer to that for several months. Uh, but that makes it a unique one because this isn't just normal supply and demand. It isn't normal uh, economic issues. This is something more fundamental. It's, it's a government shutting its borders to recyclables. Gotcha. So it sounds like this one could be a little bit different then, depending on how things play out. Though, as you mentioned, the idea of, um, you know, getting working around the quality standards and, of course, China still needs 
or presumably need some of this material as manufacturing feedstock um, brings up an interesting idea that I believe you've touched on in some columns about uh, ways to maybe get around it. You know, we don't ship the 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 material straight over there, but we uh, process it here in the U.S. Perhaps turn it into pulp, turn it into plastic pellets or resin that can become manufacturing feedstock. Do you think that's perhaps the way of the future is to, you know, take that second step of the process here, but China can still, you know, be the main buyer of this material? Well, there's sort of two answers to that. First of all, if they actually decide they're going to bar all recyclables, what would the impact of that be on their domestic papermaking industry? If their goal is, is to get their, their, their raw materials from these industries, from domestically generated recyclables, and from buying market pulp on the world market, uh, they may discover it's far harder to get the domestically generated recyclables that they're depending on, and that even if they got every scrap of paper generated in the country, you lose fiber every time you recycle it. You simply cannot use 100% of a country's internally generated fiber and continue to produce the same amount of paper product. It's impossible. So first of all, what is the limit on actual recovery? And that's a tricky one because it gets into uh, the accuracy of existing recycling rates. They have a very efficient recycling infrastructure already. How much more is truly obtainable? Plus the fact that they ship all those boxes out of the country carrying products to other countries. They've lost those boxes unless we collect them and send them back. Uh, the other option is to buy pulp on the world market. And you can do that, but there's not that much virgin pulp on the world market to satisfy China's demands and nobody else's, unless they can just buy it all, which is highly unlikely. So it, it creates an interesting situation to what are the extent to how far they can go? How much do they really care about their domestic paper mill industry? And how far are they, are they willing to go? Now, clearly, there are runarounds in the sense of shipping to other Asian countries. Uh, that's going on, but there are limits to the mill capacity in those countries. You could theoretically so the closing their doors in those Southeast Asian countries, right? Kind of throwing up, throwing their hands up, saying, "Hey, wait, we don't want all this." Absolutely, you, you have that. You have the same reaction that the Chinese had to the importation of of these materials. Uh, but you also have the potential to build new mills there and in those mills to create pulp and then simply ship the pulp to China from Southeast Asian mills. I think that's a very realistic possibility, but you just don't build a mill overnight. It takes a while to do that. So the question then becomes, <clears throat> how does the industry rebound in this country? Are, are we going to see new capacity coming online in this country? And I, I think the answer there is we have no choice. But we're also seeing that happen. And this is exactly what happened in 1990. Entrepreneurs, the paper industry, the plastic resin industry, they saw a source of raw materials. They saw a relatively inexpensive source of raw materials. And they said, essentially, why let it go to waste? There is an opportunity for us here. So that by 1993, you had a vastly expanded infrastructure in this country to use old paper as a raw material. In fact, the, old, the publication Recycling Times, which was published throughout the 90s and which, which tracked markets and, and re recycling events throughout the country, had an issue in, the, in early, it was either late 93 or early 94, in which they simply listed every new mill, every expanded mill, every additional plastic market and other markets in the country for curbside recyclables. This is about a three page list of new projects. Will we see that much in this in, in response to this particular uh, incident? I don't see why not. Maybe not that many, but already we have Pratt announcing its new mill in Ohio. Uh, we have the Green Bay Packaging Mill in uh, Wisconsin, which broke ground, I think, two or three weeks, two weeks ago, I believe. We have the notice by Cascades that they're taking the mill in Ashland, the Black Bear Mill, and turning it in into eventually into a packaging mill. Uh, and we see three closed American paper mills bought by Chinese companies 
with the, with the idea of converting those into, well, nobody quite knows yet what they're going to do with them. Are they going to make boxes for sale in this country? Are they going to make boxes and ship them to China? Are they simply going to make pulp and ship them that to China? Nobody knows. But those have already been announced. I understand there have always already been changes in uh, uh, in the processing at a number of mills so they can better accommodate residential mixed paper in particular. So we've seen that happen. And we've also seen this on the plastic side uh, with new plastic processors in, in uh, uh, Alabama, South Carolina, and one or two other states. And it was interesting that when the plastic processors were announced, they're, they're, they're primarily Chinese-owned, the immediate reaction from the government was they have absolutely no objection to taking pellets or resin made from recycled fiber. It will be the same reaction to taking pulp made from recycled fiber. What the Chinese government is essentially saying is they want this processing to be done elsewhere, but they're happy to have the product, whether it's, it's fiber and pulp uh, or, 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 or plastic pellets or resin, uh, they're not totally barring the gates, they're just barring the gates to unprocessed paper. Uh, certainly right now, unprocessed mixed paper and mixed plastics. Gotcha. So it sounds like, great. Right, a lot of it's still very up in the air. We'll know more in, who knows, a month or six months or a year. This thing is very fluid. Um, I wonder what it will take to get more of that kind of domestic closed loop situation that folks are aspiring to and in accomplishing in certain regions. You know, if China, maybe is still willing to take this material in a cleaner form, you know, as feedstock, do we then hold ourselves back in the U.S. from, you know, creating a more sustainable, robust infrastructure that can last for decades to come, or are we just going to find another workaround to keep exporting the material? You know, what do you think kind of is the main barrier to getting that system in the U.S.? I, I don't think there's a barrier per se. I think it's the willingness to make the investment. It's the willingness to do two things, one of which is to work with your stock preparation system so it can take a dirtier waste stream, residential mixed paper, and the willingness to invest the money. We've already seen that with the three mills that have been announced, the new ones. I, I believe you'll see more of those. I mean, personally, I prefer that the material remain in this country and be processed and used as, as end products in this country, uh, but it's good to have a, have a a certain amount going out of the country. You know, we didn't really export much recycled paper until the late 90s or the early 2000s. Uh, yeah. I, I was at a meeting that, that a group that the old NSWMA used to have that we held in San Jose, California in 96, I think it was. And a gentleman named Dan Cotter, who used to run the San Francisco recycling program, then became involved in paper recycling uh, uh, now is very active in paper recycling. Dan, at that meeting, laid out what was going to happen with China. Laid out the expansion of mills there, that they were buying equipment, that they were going to be world-class machines, that is that they were going to be a major market for, for American waste paper. And for the people at that room, this was a real eye-opener. And I've talked to some of the people who were there then, and they go, yeah, they remembered that, that, that he, it, it really was a very wise observation. Uh, I think we're going to go back to a situation where we don't export as much, but I think we will always have export. Gotcha. Okay. And um, as we kind of hit the second half of this, turning to the policy side, that was the topic of your uh, most recent column, you know, this idea of how to move forward in a structure where a lot of states and cities and or counties have pretty ambitious uh, recycling goals on the books. Some may or may not be attainable, but they are written into law in some cases. Um, how do you, what would you recommend to folks in local or state government? I, some of them I think are trying to wait this one out and say, no, oh, maybe it will write itself. Maybe we can still hit these targets. In the near term, it doesn't seem like that's the case. Should people reevaluate some of these goals they've set and you know find a better way to benchmark it? Well, that's actually a whole bunch of questions in some yeah. ways. I think the first thing on some of the more aggressive goals is it won't be the first time states have developed amnesia about goals they've set for this, that, or the other thing. I don't. I think that'll be the same for some of the state goals for recycling. 
but I, I, I think there's really two, two ways to approach the question. One is what the recycling industry does. The other is what legislation legislators do. I do expect more state interest in legislation next year because politicians listen to their constituents. They read the paper. I have yet to find a successful politician who opposed recycling. It's, it's very yeah. easy to support. It's very popular. Politicians love to do something, and they love to do something about something that's politically supported. So, yes, I do expect to see more legislation year, next year attempts to fix the situation. Uh, I don't think you'll see new aggressive goals. Uh, I think the major thrust at this point is twofold. It's, it's getting the public to finally accept the fact that recycling is not free. It's a service. Garbage is not free. Landfilling is not free. Why should recycling be free? Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, you got to pay for the trucks, you got to pay for the crew, and you have to have some mechanism to balance market risk because recycling does involve that fluctuation of the end market value. And we keep losing sight of this. Uh, again, this is not the first time markets collapsed. We run around like chickens with our heads cut off. The sky is falling, but we don't seem to learn from it. We don't seem to say to ourselves, there's got to be a better way to do this. You know, I was at a conference at the White House in, in 1998 during one of the little price collapses for recycling. Virtually everything that was mentioned at that conference as a solution has been mentioned again. And so you wonder, why do we have this terrible short-term memory loss? We, we, we keep forgetting. We need to plan for the future. I think we need to start setting up some kind of funds that can be used as rainy day funds for recycling when prices go down. Uh, local governments have to start accepting some share of the risk of fluctuating markets, uh, or uh, they had to buy into contracts that allow for fluctuating monthly charges or prices, similar, for instance, to what the Casella company, company has done. Those options are out there. Now, if I was the local government, would I want to take on a new expense now? I would resist. I get that. But sooner or later, your contract comes to an end. Sooner or later, you're going to have to have, to have a real serious meeting about what you're going to do next and what it means for recycling. Gotcha. At the state level and the local level, at the local level, I think you're going to see programs looking, do they want to continue with the same materials? Do they want to maybe peel off some materials because they don't really bring that much in terms of tonnage or value or even environmental impact, but at the same time are more are very expensive to handle, very expensive to manage. That I think is going to play out on its own. Clearly, the industry has to clean up its act. We've got to be more efficient in processing. We've got to have real technological innovations, which, which we've been seeing. You know, optical sorting, uh, the various things that you can do in processing the systems. We, we've seen tremendous leaps and bounds in, in MRFs. And, and you don't, but you don't just change a MRF overnight. Uh, it, it takes a while to reconfigure a MRF. It takes a while to buy the equipment. And one of the ir ironies of the tariff war is the tariffs are going to make, are making new MRFs more expensive. Because steel is a primary component when you build when you build a MRF. And steel is going to be more expensive. It's inevitable. Yeah, no, it's a good point on that. And uh, trucks perhaps as well. You know, I think a lot of folks have bought their fleets for the year, but That's next year right. is gonna get pricey. Um, interesting, I want to parse through those. Some good insight on this. I wonder, going back to your comment about, you know, we seem to have an amnesia. You went to this meeting at the White House twenty some years ago. Do you get any sense that our somewhat unique decentralized policy structure here in the U.S. might have something to do with that. <laughs> I know you and I have talked. It's you know, Rick, uh, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Yeah, Makes and so I have to wonder, right? We you know we talk to folks from other countries, and they they don't get it sometimes. They say, "Wait, you that's you leave it to the states?" It's, yes, that's what we do here. Whereas we've seen examples in the past year of say Japan or Australia, granted knowing they have very different systems, but they've kicked in some federal funding to try to help with the infrastructure here. Are we just at a disadvantage in the US because we have guidance, but no policy at the federal level? Know. 
I don't know if it's a disadvantage. We're such a large country in terms of population, 300 and I guess 30 million people now. Physically, we're a very large country. Uh, I personally don't think the federal government has the ability to call all the shots from Washington on how recycling can be done. Uh, I'm from Oklahoma. I, don't, I just don't think the government knows it all. Fair. At this, and, and RECRA, the, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, makes it clear solid waste, including recycling. Recycling as it relates to local government programs, curbside, municipal kinds of programs. That's a state and local responsibility. Record is very clear about that. And I don't think there's much interest in Congress right now and all the work on their platter to go in and try to amend RECRA over recycling. Uh, I just don't yeah. see that happening. In fact, the last serious attempt on that was in 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a bill called the Multi-Options Packaging Strategy that got out of a subcommittee of the old House Energy and Commerce Committee, but it never came to a vote in the, in the full uh, committee. <clears throat> so, and, and I think right now what you want, it's just absolutely essential the Congress continue to fund EPA and the EPA solid waste program. Uh, the program survived some, something of a close call in the previous budget. And I think it's always going to be up in the air. There, there will, I believe, be a brand new chairman of the House Appropriations Committee next year. It's going to be very important where that chairman is from. The current one is from New Jersey. He understands recycling. He gets the local politics. What about next year? And so I think that's very important. The EPA has always had a great role as a source of information and a source of activism for pushing forward on recycling. I think it's a damn shame that they can no longer talk about the greenhouse gas impact of recycling, but sooner or later, sanity will return to the agency and they'll get back to that. But they still have a purpose and, and a lot they can do. Fair. No, it's true. Now, we saw some of them at the recent WasteCon, you know, in Nashville. They seem to be doing good work. A lot of, you know, right. things are happening at the EPA. Um, I wonder then, so in that scenario, and you're right, you know, uh, practically, yeah, do not expect recycling to be on Congress's agenda anytime soon. And so with that in mind, who should, say you're in a state government or county government, and you don't know a ton about this, so you don't really know what, who to turn to. Maybe there's a large, a couple, you know, whatever the large service provider is in your state, you're going to talk to them, of course, because they know what's going on. But who, be it a group or a person or agency, like who, do you, who should people look to as the arbiter to kind of help give a clear picture of how this is all coming together? Right now, it feels like it's easy to get, not misled, but, you know, you're going to hear it from various interested parties, be it, you know, what, how they think things should go. But there's not necessarily an impartial party to help government folks sort this out, unless I'm missing somebody. Who, who do you look to? Well, I think at the state level, you've got your state recycling associations, and you've got 50 states. They're varying size and, and, and quality, but they're, they're always, if they do their job, they're always going to be a resource for the state government. Mm -hmm. uh, you should have people within the state government itself, although funding of the state solid waste and recycling agencies has been on the decline over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, beyond that, it's the recycling industry itself uh, stepping forward and, and being more involved. And I think you've seen a lot of companies doing a lot of good things in terms of, of, of educational efforts and, and, and talking to their customers and trying to resolve issues. I, I, I think that's the best way to do it, frankly. Fair. Right. So, yeah, in an open market system, it, it is logical to look to the companies, basically. Um, okay. And I wonder at what point... And this is the tough part. And there's all, all kinds of companies, different shapes and sizes. But there's few, if any, large scale recycling only companies these days, right? And so it's recycling is always competing against going to be at a landfill or waste energy facility. There's other places to send this stuff if we're looking at costs alone. How do we? Do you think there's need for a new cost accounting structure to you know think about? It's not just tip fee, but there's other externalities, other ways to make recycling look more appealing financially? If, well, in theory, that sounds great. In practice, I'm not sure how well it can be done because you get into so many variables, you're starting to make so many value judgments. Uh, you know, if you're a hauling company in this country, 
you have no choice but to offer a recycling program because your customers want it. Whether it's your commercial customers, which is the bread and butter of the hauling industry, or whether it's your residential customers, they want a recycling program. So you really have two choices. Actually, you have three. You can simply refuse to do it. Uh, you can offer the service and do a lousy job, or you can offer the service and do a good job. And in any competitive market, the ones that offer a service and do a good job will win those accounts. And if you win those accounts, you're also going to have their business, period. And, and this is the way, you know, a market economy works. So I don't think the companies have an inherent bias against recycling. What they have a bias against is losing money. And that's where the problem of fluctuating markets come in because, you know, garbage is pretty easy. It's a matter of logistics. It's a matter of collection efficiency. It's a matter of a, de of a disposal site. Recycling is a matter of logistics. It's a matter of collection efficiency and good service, but it's also a matter of processing. And then your collection sites, instead of having an understood guaranteed tip fee, have a widely varying price that they will pay you for those materials. It's a different equation. And it's just a, it's a more difficult challenge for a company. You know, in, in the scrap business, a scrap company expects to lose money every four years or so, but they plan for it. Uh, it's a lot harder to plan for those kinds of economic losses if you're a local government doing the recycling program or if you're a publicly traded hauler doing the, the to that, that recycling program. Uh, so we have to learn to how to handle those fluctuations. We have to learn how to, if you will, create rainy day funds for recycling. Interesting. And that, I guess so that does sound like a potential role for government of some level, be it state or local, in that scenario, right? We, to kind of government, that definitely. Absolutely. Right. I can, right. I'm not seeing a publicly traded company having a rainy day fund, but a, a government could. And that okay. would be a way I mean, you, to you fill can, that in. I, don't see, I, I personally don't know of any legal reasons you couldn't. You just had to be up board about it. And the right. stockholders have to understand that's part of the way the business runs. Um, just a few more for you as we wind down. I want those lines of, you know, the role of local government. Um, an interesting point came up at WasteCon the other week, and this is very anecdotal, but that maybe some local governments are interested in uh, getting back into the recycling business when perhaps they had privatized it before in some form. You know, they say, well, this is a public service. We want to guarantee. We recognize the costs are hard to bear. You know, maybe there's a role for us here. Do you You've, of course, seen the privatization trends in your time in the industry. Do you think there's any chance of that pendulum swinging back, or is it too far gone now? Uh, you could. I, you know, I don't see why it couldn't. The, the collection of recyclables is more privatized than the collection of garbage. So in that sense, there's more opportunities for it. But that would also mean the local governments would have to be willing to accept that risk. And it had to be willing to set up those, those, those funds to plan for the future. And we'll see whether or not they, they're willing to do that. Fair. Um, another interesting point, I believe it's from your June column, you know, you're looking at, oh, who killed recycling was the sort of the, the angle there. Yes. And you pointed that maybe some of the, the friends of recycling might share some blame as well. This quote, magical thinking, you know, about passing laws and hoping we can hit these targets. We've covered the you know the policy side a bit, but I'd be curious on both the packaging companies and the consumers. You know, some quick thoughts on where they fit into this puzzle. The packaging companies are making a lot of big uh, goals, sustainability goals, getting more engaged in the dialogue, but it still feels like there's a bit of a disconnect sometimes. Where do you see them fitting into the future of this going forward? I think they will. Con well, what I hope they do is put more emphasis on buying recyclables to use recycled content in their packages. And we've seen some great things on some of the PET markets lately in particular from some of those packaging companies and, and consumer products companies. Uh, that's the most important thing they can do. Uh, you can argue they should design for recycling. Personally, I think they should design for the environment. I think they should design a package that has the least potential impact on the environment, regardless of whether or not it can be recycled. That's heresy, but so be it. Um, and, and I think they certainly can help publicize recycling better. They can, they can, can help to um, uh, 
with groups such as the Recycling Partnership and, and the, the educational campaigns, uh, help fund those. And a lot of companies have stepped forward in that. I think with consumers, we just have to continue to be better trained in what to do and how to do it. But I think part of the problem is we sort of need to decide what we really need to recycle to make recycling work and what we can just let be for the time being. I live in a county with a very good recycling program. We have a recycling rate over 50% for MSW. It's a solid program. I'm not always sure what I'm supposed to put at the bin. The education the county does, but I'm still a little confused about what to put at the bin. And I think that's partially because of the utter variety of packaging, but it's also because sometimes in education programs, it's hard to get the message through and frankly, some of the stuff I'm agonizing over in the schemes is, the scheme of things is pretty insignificant. You know, plastic mm -hmm. caps, um, um, PET black trays, which generally should not be recycled, but apparently can be in my, my county. I can't figure that one out. That sort of thing. There is confusion. Now, it would be nice to have a statewide list of recyclables. You've got that now in Connecticut. I think it's a great thing. Because then you can really harmonize your, your, your public education. You can harmonize on, on your do's and don'ts. And you can be much more effective about it. Yeah, no, the uh, universal list is uh, very appealing to some folks. Uh, here in Massachusetts, our DEP just announced one a couple weeks ago as well. Yep. That will start to get adopted. In and and the DEP has done a great job on, on, on advertising throughout the state and, and, and getting that set up. Yeah, no, and I, th I think a lot of folks see that as helpful. There will be some interesting... Um, Maybe battles too strong of a word, but some conversations with certain packaging companies as things get dropped from that list. For example, uh, cartons did not make the cut here in Massachusetts. And so the carton folks are, have some thoughts on that. They would like to see their material be considered recyclable. But in, in, interesting how things will play out. Yep. Um, we're winding down here, but just some kind of parting thoughts on, you know, the average person. I got a lot of the folks watching this probably are pretty tuned into recycling. We don't have many newcomers, but, you know, this idea of, awareness versus personal action is interesting. You know, we, we can read about it. We can try to read our educational guidelines. But do you think there's room for people to do more just in terms of reducing their consumption, perhaps being more conscious about what they buy so they don't have to recycle it in the first place? I think there's always room for reducing consumption. And clearly, source reduction is the most important thing we can do. It's also the most misunderstood because, for instance, as bottles have gotten lightweighted, which is source reduction at its best, they've also become more difficult to recycle. It's, it's kind of a yin-yang thing in a way. But I think for individual people, it's one thing to say we should reduce our consumption. It's another thing to actually do it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we're human beings. We like things. We like to buy things. We like to consume things. It's very deeply rooted within us. And I, I, I'm a little personally skeptical of some of the, the use less campaigns because, yes, there are some people who are very motivated to do that. I try to do that, but Lord knows I'm not perfect about it. And I think far more of us are in the Lord knows I'm not perfect about it category than the I'm going to reduce my consumption immediately category. You know, one of the real successes of getting stuff out of the waste stream has been backyard uh, composting and leave it on the lawn grass, uh, uh, lawn mowers, grass cycling. Mm. That probably took 15 to 20 million tons out of the waste stream because the stuff never got put on the curb, never needed to be composted or sent to a disposal system. And, but that was easy to do. I, that's, you just buy a different lawn mower and you mulch your lawn, big deal. Right. Uh, other actions are a lot harder. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's a topic I plan to be watching a bit going forward. It's still very under the surface, but it comes up sometimes in conversations. You know, if anyone can find a way to monetize reuse or reduction, uh, they'll certainly be onto something, and that would change it'll the conversation. Be, it'll be fascinating to see how the refillable bottles work out in Oregon. Um, yes. I, I've seen uh, one or two ads for them on Facebook or somewhere, or maybe it was LinkedIn, I can't remember where. Uh, there's clearly a lot of interest in Oregon to recreating, and they have set up an infrastructure for refillable bottles. 
I think it's a great idea. I hope it succeeds. I wish I had yeah. access to refillable bottles. I really don't have it here. Same. No. Uh, yeah. And for any viewers who may not be familiar, Oregon's um, basically container deposit system is now doing refillable glass bottles in a yeah. pilot. I believe. I'm not sure if it's statewide, but um, yeah, very exciting. And I know TerraCycle is set to announce. It's very mysterious, but they're going to have some big, uh, reusable refillable announcement at Davos, I think, in January coming up. So we'll be watching to see what that is. And if anyone can find it, they would find a way to make money on it. They're pretty creative. So who knows? Um, you and I should both go to Davos. Exactly. I know, right? I think the company should just send me anything. That's if you're listening. Um, we do have one question uh, coming in from somebody. I'm not, I'll, I'll just read it and see what you make of this, Chad. He asks uh, Does the recycling industry accept the idea of clean conversion of contaminated wastes to baseload energy? I think we're getting at waste energy here. Perhaps is you know is that a viable solution for some low value materials? Well, by contaminated waste, I'm not sure that means that contaminated recyclables are all waste. Uh, depends on the company. You have a number of companies who are very heavily invested in waste energy systems. Uh, you have other companies who aren't, but it's in the market where they 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 are, and if it's a competitive price. They'll take it to those facilities as opposed to more expensive landfills, which you do see in particular with the merchant facilities in the Northeast. I don't think there's really a uniform answer on that out of the recycling industry. The recycling industry would be prefer that there be no contaminated waste. There'll just be pure recyclables. I mean, that, that would be the recycling industry's goal and markets for all of those pure recyclables. Exactly. Okay, fair. Um, and that actually, that sparks a quick uh, question I've been having lately, um, this concept of, quote, chemical recycling. I don't know if you've heard this coming up at conferences at all, uh, especially for things like uh, flexible packaging, things that don't, you know, A, probably traditionally shouldn't go through a MRF, and B, maybe don't have a clear end market, but are becoming a growing part of our packaging stream. You know, it seems like the plastics folks are interested in finding ways to capture some value out of that. Do you think that is a viable path forward? I think there are many projects that look very good on paper and may or may not work well in a small scale test situation. But when faced with 500 tons a day, reality can really start to bite. I mean, I've been doing this since 1976. I've heard of miracle technology since 1976. I haven't seen them work yet. That doesn't mean they won't. That doesn't mean they can't. Uh, I just haven't seen them work yet. Fair. Okay. Um, oh, we're getting a couple more questions. We're, we'll do one more with our timing here. Uh, question on single stream recycling, uh, a popular topic right now. You know, has the push for single stream recycling uh, set us up for failure, you know, by having higher contamination rates and, uh, Again, and I guess, too, was this pushed by larger companies at the expense of smaller operations? What are your thoughts? Uh, no, it, it didn't set us up for failure per se. It was in a single stream was an inevitable result of high recycling targets and cost control. The higher the target, the more you collect, the more stuff you're going to have in that recycling bin, the higher the likelihood of contamination. We simply can't connect 28 separate bags of potential recyclables every once a week. Uh, I happen to live in a county that does dual stream. I'm very happy with dual stream in my county. I don't want to see it change. Other counties are different. Uh, but I understand the reason for single stream. It was a very legitimate and a very sincere attempt to deal with rising costs and rising recycling goals. Uh, and in no way, shape, or form was, was, was in an attempt to harm recycling. Uh, I think, quite frankly, you know, the original single streams were pretty primitive. They, they were really paper, glass, and, and cans, and, and PET maybe, because single stream goes back to the, really to the late 80s. What really hurt single stream was the rapid increase in the materials we collect for recycling. Hmm. And the more stuff you collect, the higher but the possibility of contamination. That's unavoidable. Got it. Well, a, a storyline I'm sure that will continue to go on for a while, single versus dual stream. It's a, a new conversation right now, so I look forward to seeing that. Um, in our parting moments, uh, Ranjith has asked if there's anything, you know, you're 
looking toward for the future panelists today. Uh, any questions you may have, they should have in mind. Next up, we have Kate Davenport and Lynn Hoffman from Eureka Recycling. Always uh, a good example of you know a well-run MRF out in the Midwest. Anything you'd like to hear from them? Uh, no, I'd just like to listen in and hear what they have to say. I don't, I don't have any, any, uh, any, any particular questions. Gotcha. Um, well, Jess, thanks so much for taking the time. Good talking to you as always. Thank and thank you, Randy, for the opportunity. Thank you, Ranjit. No problem, Chaz and Cole. Thank you so much for, for your time. Um, I've, I've always um, enjoyed um, speaking to both Cole and Chaz. I mean, um, they know so much about um, this stuff. And um, so I thought, you know, why not put them together on a panel? And um, by then, Chaz um, published uh, an article about how it'll be um, short term pain, but on the long term, you know, markets will come back. And Cole read that and wanted to interview Chaz. Um, so everything worked out very well. And, um, you know, here, here we have both of you here. So thank you so much um, for your time. And now um, I'll bring Kate on and 